This is a BMW Z1. You've probably heard of the Z3 and the Z4 and the Z8, but if you haven't heard of the Z1, well, you're in for a treat. Here's a little overview. The Z1 is a two-seat roadster with two doors, and as you can see, the doors don't swing out like normal doors. Instead, they go down into the body. More on that in a second. Now, the Z1 was sold for only a few years, in the late 1980s through June 1991, and BMW only made 8,000 of these. I strongly suspect the reason it's so rare is because of the price tag. Back when this car was new in 1990, it cost more than a BMW 7 Series. It cost as much as a new Porsche 911. The equipment equivalent of around $100,000 in today's money, even though it was based on the BMW 3 Series and it used the same engine from the 3 Series of its time. Now, one major reason why you may have never heard of the Z1 if you live in North America is that BMW never sold this car in the United States or in Canada. And yet, I've traveled all the way to La Jolla, California, near San Diego, to review this imported one, which I borrowed from La Jolla Independent, an excellent BMW shop here in La Jolla that's basically heaven for BMW enthusiasts. Today, I'm going to take you on a tour of the Z1. I'm going to show you all of its weird quirks and unusual features, including the most obvious one, which I'm sure you're already wondering about. Then I'm going to get it out on the road and find out how the Z1 drives, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the Z1, go to autotrader.com oversteer, where I've also compiled a list of some other interesting BMW models models that I suspect you've never heard of. Okay, so I'm going to start where you obviously want me to start, and that would be with the doors. Yes, the doors retract into the body when you want to get inside the car, and yes, they come back up when you want to close them. I'm not really sure why they did this. They were trying to be cool and different, and they succeeded. Now, I've always assumed that in order to get into a Z1 or out, you pull this thing, this door handle. Well, it turns out that has no effect. Pulling that, pushing that, doesn't do anything. Don't touch it. Instead, if you want the doors to go up and down, you press this after unlocking it. And they pop right up, and as you can see, the window closes as the door closes, and so now it's flushed. If I put on the top, I could then lock it using this little silver thing here, and then the car would be locked just like any normal car. I want to get back in. Again, I don't push the handle or push down on the door or anything. I walk up. I push the silver thing and the door retracts surprisingly quickly and of course the window retracts too and now I can step inside. Now obviously that begs the question, how do you get inside this car? Because the doors are as they are, BMW had to put all of the crash protection and structure for the car below them so this door sill is incredibly high and as a result there's a little bit of a technique to getting in. Apparently the easiest way to do it is first put one leg in, then grab on to this little roll bar on the top of the windshield, more on that in a minute, and then get inside. It's not that difficult or that bad, especially once you get used to it, but it is worth noting that one of the reasons I did it that way is you're not supposed to sit on this. Ultimately, this is the top of the door and it won't support your weight, so you can't sit on this and climb over it when you're getting inside a Z1. Good to know just in case you ever happen to get inside a Z1. Of course, getting out is also kind of complicated. Again, grab the roll bar on the windshield and then just do what you got to do. It's not incredibly difficult, but then again, it's also not incredibly easy, and I imagine it would be a lot harder if you were wearing a skirt or a dress. But let's go back. Now you're in your Z1, and you're wondering, all right, well, how do I close the door? Well, again, you don't do anything with this exterior door handle. In fact, I have no idea why that's there. It doesn't have any apparent function in this car. Instead, you pull a little latch located inside the interior. It looks a lot like any other BMW door latch, except, well, it's next to your shin. You pull it, and the door closes. And so now the door is closed, just like in any normal car. In fact, sitting here in this position with the door up, this looks just like a normal car with a normal driving position, except for the fact that the door panel has basically nothing on it, which is unusual. Now, let's say it's time to get out. What do I do? I pull that latch again, the door slides back down, and then it's time for me to climb out. It's actually surprisingly simple, considering this is such a novel and bizarre concept. Something else I like about the door situation in the Z1, on a normal car, your passenger gets out, they forget to close the door, or they don't close it all the way. You have to get out, walk all the way around, and close the door again. In the Z1, no problem. Just reach over, pull the latch, and the door closes. There's nothing like a nice automatic door that closes upwards. Now, there are two other interesting things worth noting about the Z1 doors, one of which is the fact that when the door is in its up position, 
you can roll down a window like in any normal car. So you can have the door up and the window down and just you're cruising along like you're in a little roadster and put the window up. Basically any normal vehicle does that. But when the door is in its down position, they don't let you do anything with the windows. You're just stuck with the door down. Then again, I have no idea why you'd want to bother with the windows or with putting the doors up because in this car, yes, it's true, you can drive around with the doors in the down position and it's glorious. Okay, so you've seen how the doors work. You've seen how to get inside the car from the outside, out from inside, all that stuff. You might think I'm done with the doors, but not quite because there are a couple of other interesting things that happen when you make a car with doors that slide downwards instead of open. For example, the doors can't really contain anything because sometimes they might be down, so you can't put anything on them. Now, there, aside from that exterior door handle, which has no apparent function, everything else has been relocated off the doors, and that is more stuff than you think. For instance, the exterior keyhole, like I showed you before, is on the bodywork itself, so it doesn't move when the doors go up and down. That one's pretty obvious, but how about the mirror? In virtually every other car, the mirror is on the doors, but not in this one, because when the doors are down, you wouldn't be able to see anything. So the mirror is moved to the windshield frame. That's kind of interesting, but how about this? The mirror controls. In your car, they're probably on the door. In this car, they're hidden in the center console underneath the climate controls. They operate just like normal mirror controls, but you'd never know where to find them unless you know where to find them. Also interesting in the same vein are the interior door handles like I showed you before. They look like normal interior door handles, but you don't often see interior door handles mounted basically on the floor of the car. And then how about this? Now on the outside, you can lock the doors using the key and that lock that's on the bodywork like I showed you. But when you're sitting inside with the doors up, you can't lock the doors. It's not possible to lock the doors on the inside of this car when you're in it. Then again, a carjacker or a thief would have to really know a lot about BMWs to even figure out how to get inside this thing. One more interesting door-related quirk. I was told it's fine to open the doors when you're getting in, showing it off in the video, but don't overdo it because replacing the belts that move the doors up and down is kind of a process. For one thing, you have to remove the doors to do it, and the doors themselves weigh more than 150 pounds, so it's a bit of an annoyance. Now, although the doors are by far the quirkiest and strangest thing about the Z1 and what it's most known for, there are a couple of other interesting quirks and features, the biggest of which is the body panels. Now, this may look like a normal car with normal body panels, but actually they're plastic. That isn't metal. Now I'll get to why they did the plastic body panels in just a minute, but for now, take a look at these body panels. One of the things that happens to plastic body panels after 25 or 30 years is they can start to crack, which is kind of unfortunate, but that's a reality when you have plastic body panels just like in your Saturn. Another interesting thing about the Z1 is the hood opening. Now, opening the hood itself is actually pretty easy. You just pull a little latch and it pops right open, except you go around to open the hood and it only comes up this much. Well, that's because the hood in this car opens this way. Now you may think that's odd, but actually a lot of BMWs for a long time had their hoods open this way, and BMW only stopped this practice in the early to mid 1990s. Another interesting quirk about the Z1 is this bar that sticks out from the windshield. Now, in most convertible cars that are difficult to get into, you're told no matter how hard it is to get into, never touch the windshield, because if you put your weight on the windshield frame, you can buckle it, which obviously can screw things up. But in this car, this bar sticks out of the windshield and it's the roll bar. They didn't mount one back here. This is the roll bar, which means if you roll over, this bar can support the entire weight of the car. Now, because of that, you can put your weight on this bar when you're trying to get in and out of the car. In fact, you can put as much weight on it as you want to, and it won't cause any problems. Now, the other function that this bar has is that it is where BMW has mounted the sun visors, and they are the tiniest sun visors I've ever seen in any car ever. Now, I've said this a lot about various exotic sports cars that I've reviewed over time, but this is the new tiny sun visor champion by far. 
One other interesting quirk about this car is the fact that there's no dome light. Obviously, it's a convertible, so they couldn't stick one up here. And they didn't want to stick one on the windshield because of this bar. So instead, they placed the dome lights in rather unusual places. One of them is between the seats. There's a little light that aims down at the center console mounted on the carpet between the seats. The other one is even stranger. It's where the glove box would have been. You have your normal dome light. It's like they just moved it from the top to there on the passenger side. Another thing about the Z1 is that it has unique seats, although BMW was building sporty cars when the Z1 came out. It wasn't building any other sports cars, so these tight little sport seats were reserved solely for this car. Now, speaking of the seats, this car has a glove box, but it isn't in the normal place you'd expect to find a glove box. Instead, they've placed it in the single most inconvenient place possible, and that would be behind the passenger seat. So in order to get to it, not only do you have to fold the passenger seat forward, but you have to move it up, and then you can access the glove box. In other words, don't keep anything in the glove box that you may actually need access to while, you know, you're driving. But aside from the few interesting interior quirks that I already covered, this car is actually surprisingly normal on the inside, and I was told that before I came here. It actually feels just like an E30 BMW 3 Series. The climate controls are where you'd expect, the stereo is where you'd expect, there's nothing strange with the gauge cluster or with the turn signal stocks or the parking brake or the shifter or the window controls. It's all fairly normal. I guess BMW spent most of their development budget weirdifying the doors and the body panels, and they stopped short of making the interior any stranger than it needed to be. Next up, since I'm talking about storage, it's time to talk about the trunk, which is another interesting quirk of the Z1. Now, in order to open the trunk, you push this little silver keyhole, just like you do with the doors, and then it opens right up. Now, the trunk isn't very big, and I wasn't really expecting it to be, but to me, the interesting thing about the trunk is just how tiny the opening is. It's probably barely bigger than a foot. In fact, I don't even know how they got the tire in here. But they did. Nonetheless, this is all you get in terms of trunk space in the Z1. And of course, that's not the only thing in this car that's small. How about the tiny little fuel door mounted right here on the rear fender? And there's no security to this fuel door. It doesn't lock. You don't pop it from the inside. You just walk up, open it right up. And inside, there's the fuel cap. BMW didn't waste any space inside this fuel door with unnecessary whatever. And those aren't the only things that are surprisingly tiny on this car. How about up front? You're used to the BMW grills being giant focal points in the front of the BMWs, but this car, it has the grills, but they're just so small, and they're all the way in the front, and they're sort of at the bottom of the bumper, so you might not notice. But they're still there. After all, it is a BMW. And speaking of badging and emblems, I've always found the Z1 badge on the rear of these to be kind of odd. Now, these days, BMW uses separate badges for each letter, five, three, five, or whatever. But back in the day, they used to all be connected so BMW could save money on badging. But there wasn't really an easy way to connect a Z to a one. So they just stuck a line from the bottom of the Z to the top of the one, and it resulted in this. <laughs> the end result is that it looks more like you're driving around on a BMW Z A than a Z1. Doesn't really look all that good, but nonetheless, that's what they decided to do. Okay. So those are all the interesting quirks and the cool features of the Z1, but there's still one quirk left to mention, and that would be the body panels. Now, as I showed you before, this car had plastic body panels, and I told you I was going to tell you more about that. Well, here's the more about that. The body panels were intended to be removable. The theory was you could buy a full separate set of body panels in case you wanted to change the color of your Z1 on a whim. So you could have two sets, and BMW claimed that you could change them out in 40 minutes, only there was a problem. The TV show Wheeler dealers, which is an excellent show, they did an episode with a BMW Z1 and they changed out the body panels and it actually took them <laughs> six hours. So I strongly suspect nobody really took advantage of changing the color of their Z1 as BMW intended. Now, although the removable body panels themselves are interesting, something I find almost as unusual is the fact that this car has a very green interior to match its green exterior. The steering wheel is green, the carpeting is green, the backs of the seats are green, even the trunk carpeting is green. It seems strange to me that a car that was designed so that you could swap its colors would have such an interior that is devoted to the color it came with initially. Another interesting thing about the color swapping is that this particular Z1 does display one example of its color changing capabilities up here. Now, all the Z1s were sold with headlight housings that match their original color, but in this car, they're red. Now, red was by far the most common color on a Z1, but this car obviously is green, and yet it has the red headlight housings. They were switched out at some point. So perhaps there's a red Z1 driving around out there somewhere with green headlights. Anyway, time to get this thing out on the road and see how it performs. And remember, the Z1 has the same engine from the E30 BMW 325i, even though back in 1990, this thing cost as much as a new Porsche 911. Driving the Z1. This is the most bizarre experience, driving a vehicle without doors. 
I don't even know <laughs> what is going on here. Now the interesting thing I've been told, and it seems to be true, that this car is really just an E30 uh, 3 Series with a different body. Uh, and, and already, even in 30 seconds of driving, I can tell the powertrain, the shifter, the clutch, it all feels like that. This is hilarious. I actually love this. You know, I've been in La Jolla, which is like this little beach town uh, just north of San Diego, and this is the perfect car for this. You know, the, it's, it's not sunny, but it's, it's warm out, and the beach is right there, and uh, this is a great little beach car. It's like a mini moke, except it's fast and fun. The funny thing is, if I want, I can put the doors up as I'm driving. Oh, nice little horn. It does sort of feel like an E30 in here. It has the same basic cockpit. The, the, the center console is a little bit different. A few things are a little different. The seats are obviously different, but in terms of performance, it clearly feels like that. Um, but one big difference is this particular vehicle doesn't have doors. <laughs> I love BMWs. I love the shifter action. I love the clutch. This car is 25, almost 30 years old now, and it's still, BMWs just feel so fun to drive when they have a stick shift. The clutch, it's like you know what you're doing instantly. The shifter feels so good. It's tight, but it's not so hard that you're having trouble moving it. It's just awesome. Now, as I get going above 70 kilometers an hour, it, the wind starts to, I'm wearing shorts, the wind starts to come up and sort of push my shorts up. So it's something I gotta be careful for. <laughs> I don't know where to put my left arm. Usually I do one of these. I don't know how to, I don't know what to do. I'm having trouble focusing on the physical driving experience because the, the open air existence of this thing is so bizarre. This is just one of the stranger things I've seen. There's a Cadillac Elante and I thought that was an odd car. It's an old car, you know, it doesn't handle that well. Uh, the really interesting thing about this car is it's just not all that fast. I can't imagine what what would have happened if they had tried to sell this for the price of a 911. There's a Mirai. That's an interesting car. This is great. But I have to admit, the novelty of this car is completely rooted. The coolness is completely rooted in the no doors thing. Um, the performance at only 170 horsepower, the performance ain't there. If you're buying this thing to really floor it and really get excited and have some fun, you're gonna be sorely disappointed. There's a ton, a ton of flex when you go over bumps. The entire windshield frame shakes. It's hard enough to make a car rigid when it doesn't have a roof. Remove the doors and uh, you're, you're in a whole different world. All right, flooring it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this thing isn't fast. It's not slow, but it's no faster than an E3325i, which is, we all know is not a tremendously fast car. Albeit, it's a, it's a fun one. This is a fun car and so is that. I'm told when you drive on the highway, there's so much wind coming in with the doors down that you just end up putting them up. The interesting thing is there's very few cars, very few sports cars that are, I mean, Jeep Wrangler people can take off their doors. Uh, BMW Z4 people, they can't. So this is an unusual thing. The thing that I like about this car though is I'm having fun. I'm not really doing anything crazy in terms of speed or performance but I'm having a ton of fun because <laughs> I'm just cruising. I mean, this is the most bizarre experience I've had in a car in forever. So that's the BMW Z1. It has the performance of a slightly sportier three series. It has the removable body panels and bizarre doors of a concept car. It has the quirks and features of a typical 1980s BMW with a few extra tossed in there. And it had the original price tag of a Porsche 911. Although they're not going for that much now, these days it's easy to find one on the used market for about 35 to 50,000 euros or roughly 40 to 60,000 dollars. Either way, it is one of the strangest BMWs of all time, one of the most bizarre, and you may never see one again. And now it's time to give it a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the Z1 is fine, but not especially gorgeous. It's very much a product of its late 1980s, early 1990s time period, and it's a bit stubby. It earns a 6 out of 10. Acceleration is poor. The Z1 does 0 to 60 in 7.5 to 8 seconds, depending on what source you believe, but either way, that gives it a 1 out of 10. Handling is relatively neutral. It's pretty good, but there's a lot of chassis flex, and ultimately it feels like the 27-year-old car that it is, earning a 5 out of 10. Cool factor, however, is undeniable. Pull up at a Cars and Coffee with a Z1 and anyone looking at a Countach suddenly won't be because they'll be looking at you instead. It may not be fast or high tech, but it's very cool and it gets a 9 out of 10.
As for importance, I have to admit, I thought this car was more important before I spent the day with it, but now I realize it's more odd than significant. Still, it has a special place in this world, especially for BMW fans, and it gets a 7 out of 10. That brings the total weekend score to 28 out of 50, tying it with another ultra-cool car with a disappointing driving experience, the Lamborghini LM002. Next up are the daily categories, starting with features, and while the Z1 was fine for its time period, it's pretty low on equipment judging by today's standards, as I do for the Doug score, so it gets a 3 out of 10. Comfort is fine, it's relatively luxurious, but not exactly coddling, and the interior isn't especially roomy or easy to get in and out of, so it gets a 4 out of 10. Quality is decent, materials are nice, and reliability with this motor is well known to be pretty good, but it's certainly no standout, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Practicality is low, with just two seats, a glove box that's impossible to access, and 9.2 cubic feet of cargo space, so it gets a 3 out of 10. And then there's value. $40,000-ish is a lot of money to spend for an E30 with a different body, but this is one of the coolest BMWs around, even if it's not the fastest. Plus, it's holding its value pretty well, so I'm giving it a 6 out of 10, bringing the total daily score to 22 out of 50, which is, once again, in the lower third. As a result, it's no surprise that the total Doug score is 50 out of 100, which is relatively low. The Z1 isn't fast, it isn't especially thrilling to drive, it isn't high tech, and it's pretty expensive, but it is ultra cool. I love driving around with the doors down, and I'm so glad I had the chance to drive this one.